This Kings Island attraction gave its last rides midway through the 1978 season, but today you can't experience a ride in the industry without seeing signs of its history. Hello everyone, alongside Ryan Sir, I'm Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics. Tower Topics is a podcast by Kings Island fans, for Kings Island fans, because that's who we are, and that's who we care about. So, Ryan, on this episode, let's dive into the nostalgic world of past Kings Island attractions, and let's focus a little bit on the Bavarian Beetle. Uh, it was a compact uh, steel coaster that uh, once thrilled visitors at two Cincinnati amusement parks. Yeah, uh, it was moved from Coney Island, Cincinnati over to Kings Island. So it was one of the OG rides that was brought up. And what's funny about it is um, it's it was so brief at Kings Island that it's it's almost unknown. You know, so not a lot of people know. So it was in the place of where kind of approximately the Fest House is now. We've, we've discussed that several times. But uh, a friend of mine who worked in merchandise... Um, when they were coming out with the nostalgia pins, I was asking him, when are you going to come out with a Bavarian beetle one? And he said, we're not sure if we're going to, because there's a lot of debate if that ride even really existed. Not that he didn't know he knew it existed, but their a fear was that they come out with this pin. No one would recognize it. No one would buy the pin, you know, in hindsight, here it is 10 years later, they obviously came out with the pin, but that's just how rare this ride was. Yeah, and it was a popular selling pen, too, because if you didn't experience it, you certainly heard about it. And there's a lot of, you know, Kings Island fans that are into the park's history and they're curious about the ride. And my first memory of it was seeing it at Coney Island. Didn't ride it there, uh, but did my first visit to Kings Island in 1972. Uh, it was a, it was a fun ride, it, you know, and it it was meant to be transportable. So it was almost like a carnival kind of ride in yeah. a way. Uh, so it wasn't going to have a long shelf life to begin with. But uh it was just so much fun. You know, you, you get off the ride, you want to get back in line and ride it all over again. And, uh, the twists and turns, I mean, it was pretty intense for, for, uh, what was called a family coaster. Right. So when it was moved to Kings Island, it was put in the Oktoberfest section of the park and that's where it got the name Bavarian Beetle. But at Coney Island, it was named Galaxy. Galaxy, correct. Yeah, so it was Galaxy, which debuted in 1970 there. So it stood 45 feet tall and stretched 800 feet. That does not sound like a lot in today's world. Um, but it was, does sound long, but when you look at the action, all the turns and everything, I mean, there was a lot going on on that ride. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, a compact yet exhilarating coaster no inversions, but with tight turns and sharp drops, the small cars provided a pretty intense experience. It did. And I remember in 1976, uh, the coaster received a touch of Alpine charm, uh, with the new theming added to its station, enhancing the overall experience for riders. So talk about this uh, this new theming. This is actually the first I heard about this. What did they do to the station? It was it was just, you know, just just freshened up, you know, to fit better with that area. You know, you'd had, uh, you know, kind of fit the theming that you had in that area of Oktoberfest. You had, uh, you know, Bayern Curve had been introduced. Uh, you, you had uh, other attractions in that area that, you know, kind of fit. So they just kind of made it more or less really fit into the the theming of that area. At that time, the park was very big on theming. Yeah, theme costumes and everything. And if you ever want a testament to that, check out the old Brady Bunch and uh, Partridge Family episodes. Then they show like everybody was dressed to the parts and stuff, which is something I kind of miss about the park. I, I barely caught the tail end of that when I was younger. Um, so it had an abrupt departure. Uh, the journey took an unexpected turn in 1978 when it was quietly removed from Kings Island's attractions. The abrupt departure coincided with the introduction of the Ferris wheel, signaling a change in the park's offerings. So what happened? Yeah, that was kind of a surprise. Yeah, that was a surprise. I remember going to the park. And at that time, you know, there's no social media. There's no fan sites, you know, so there's not a lot of discussion. You know, it got removed. Not a lot talked about it. Uh, I remember going to the park, looking forward to riding it, and there's a Ferris wheel, <laughs> not the Bavarian Beetle. So it was news to me. So, it, but it was, uh, wasn't it removed like halfway through the season? Or it shut yeah, down halfway, removed through, the halfway through Yeah, it just shut down halfway through the season. The next year, here's the, uh, you know, the Ferris wheel in its place. Yeah, so it uh, was scrapped in 1978. Uh, it was the first Kings Island roller coaster to be scrapped. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. The first one to be demolished, uh, you know, they tried to sell it, but there wasn't a buyer for it. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that happened near the end of its run is there was a lawsuit, uh, the center of a legal battle when a 91 year old writer filed a negligence suit against Kings Island. Uh, the suit claimed that the park should have provided sufficient warning about the coaster's nature, you know, being, as we talked about, you know, pretty intense, you know, for, for a coaster of that size, uh, following an incident where the writer broke his neck. Now we're talking again about a 91 year old guy, uh, who probably should not have been riding the ride to begin with. But that leads us to, uh, you know, kind of uh, the legacy that the ride left behind. But because of that uh, situation and, you know, the ride being scrapped, demolished and all that, but, the, you know, followed with the lawsuit was what you see today. You know, they had the uh, the fun and safety guide that you now see on each attraction. And uh, you see this everywhere now in the industry. It wasn't there before until this. So it kind of, uh, you know, paved the way for that uh, to where the park was not telling you not to ride, wasn't telling you you can ride. It was just, here's the recommendation. If you have this, this, and that, you know, give it some thoughts. So everybody had an opportunity to see that now before they ride a ride. So that's kind of, it's, uh, it's kind of what it gave to the industry at the end of its time. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of going into the age where, common sense was out and there's no sign. So I should probably do it was in, you know, yeah, you can't leave it to a 16, 17, 18 year old ride operator to make that call, whether someone can or cannot ride, you have to know your own body, but there was nothing there to tell you if you have, you know, this issue, if you have high blood pressure, you have a back problem, you know, none of the recommendations were there. So once that happened, you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, the park came up with these, uh, you know, signs to go on, you know, the entrance of every ride. So everybody could see what you were, you know, what the ride did. And, you know, it kind of details this is a high speed roller coaster type ride. You know, those types of things that you see on those messages. Uh, Richard Fussner, he was the head of uh, safety at Kings Island at the time. He's the one that came up with the fun safety guide. And uh, you know, like I said, now you see that everywhere. Just imagine the slew of lawyers that had he probably came up with the concept and the outline. But anything neglected from the sign is, you know what? The fact that I couldn't ride this while pregnant was not on the sign. You know, just just imagine how many addendums there were to it, just especially over time, over the past, you know, 50 yeah. years or so since that came. But that's its lasting legacy, though, you know, for Bavarian Beetle. You know, it was it had a brief run at Kings Island, yet it was, you know, impactful in the presence in Kings Island's history and what you see at the park today in front of the entrance of every single ride you're going to ride there. Yeah. So every time you look at that fun and safety guide and you probably have a back problem, you're probably a little high on the blood pressure, some obesity out there, but you're going to ride anyway. Just remember that sign you're ignoring is because of the Bavarian beetle. I want to say this though, Ryan, seriously. And I, and I, you know, when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have paid much attention to those signs, but you should really adhere to what that's saying, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, if you got high blood pressure, Somebody will say, well, I don't get scared on the ride. That's not going to impact me. It doesn't work that way. Your body works differently. It's still going to feel the forces and all those kind of things. So before you do ride any ride, whether it's Kings Island, any amusement or theme park that you go to, you know, read what the sign says and, uh, you know, really do what's best based on your condition because you know your body, you know, you know what your limitations are. That part does not. Obviously, yeah, very much so. And as always, consult your physician, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I know that a lot of people, especially with like heart conditions, they specifically say steer clear of roller coasters um, or, you know, strenuous activities and stuff. So again, you know, your body, the park does not. Well, that's a Bavarian beetle. All right. So let's move on to the listener question. So Chad Howard asks, what is the first ride you'd recommend for my nine-year-old twins who are coaster curious, but still unsure? They've ridden junior coasters and like them, but last summer... A full coaster was still a bit of overwhelming for their tastes. Would the bat be a nice entry point? Don, you're the one who's raised the daughter. For me, at that age, nine years old, I would recommend the racer. I was nine the first time I rode the racer. It was the first roller coaster I ever rode. I didn't even have the luxury of uh, riding any of the uh, smaller, you know, kiddie coasters, the junior coasters out there. So I would go with the racer. I think that that would be a little uh, less frightening for them at that age than a ride like the bat would with the swinging that it does. 
I think the nature of the bat could, you know, frighten them a little bit. Maybe they don't want to go on another coaster after that experience at that age. So I, I for me, it's, it would be the racer would be the the one that goes from the junior to the next level of a, of a coaster. It's a major coaster. It's a big coaster. Uh, but I think it's the right one for that age. Yeah. And then especially now that they've done the track work and how smooth it is. Right. It, and the other transition rides that come to mind are Adventure Express is another really good one. Uh, if they've got to hang up about height, that doesn't really have a whole lot of height to it. Um, additionally, Backlot Stunt Coaster is another really good transitional ride. Um, I know that when I was young, my big hang up was I was afraid to go upside down with loops. So I would be fearless. Like I'd probably ride Orion, no problem as a eight year old, but Vortex, like I thought anybody that would get on that ride was clinically insane. Yeah. Yeah. I was never afraid really of heights. Um, you know, and once I started riding roller coasters, that didn't bother me at all, but it was more of the, you know, I looked at inversions or, you know, uh, other rides where there's a lot of spinning, you know, like those wild mouse, you know, type mm -hmm. coasters, uh, they're small in nature, but that spinning gets to me. So, uh, everybody's got a different tolerance level, you know, especially when you're very young. But, I, you know, you, you brought up some great rides, you know, Ryan, that uh, would be perfect to like Backlot and Venture Express. Awesome. Well, Chad, when Kings Island opens for the season, keep us updated as to uh, what they were brave enough to explore and keep on encouraging them because eventually they'll love them. So another listener question, Roscoe P asks, what do you expect the next big project at Kings Island to be? Well, Aaron, we'll start with you on this. What do you a think? merger with Six Flags? The next big project. That's yeah. gonna be well, okay. Um, I, I think it's gonna be a while before we see another major project. Um, I think there's some general park improvements that we're gonna see, but if I had to guess about the next project that they do, that's gonna be like, oh, that's pretty big. It's probably a water park edition. Water park editions are pound for pound, much larger in scale for the price that you pay. And the water parks, I mean, at what, 2017 or so was the last time the water park was updated. So, you know, we're coming up on that 10 year mark now almost. <laughs> what do you think? I would tend to agree with you that the water park would be the next big project. Uh, you know, he says, um, you know, what we're expecting. So for me, I would expect uh, to see water park as you've just this year touched on the kids area. You know, Orion is still relatively new for the thrill seekers. Uh, you put in... Kings Mills Antique Autos, you know, for the, the families and the other rides last year with Adventure Port, you know, more family, you know, type rides. So I think the next thing you would want to address would be the water park. Now, you know, we could be totally wrong about that. Uh, there's probably other things that uh, a lot of options on the table, you know, for what you could look at. Uh, there's always, you know, a need to look at the dining, you know, situation. You know, what can you do? Can you add another restaurant? Can you do something with Fest House and make it more like a Harmony Hall or something. There's a lot of things like that, too, uh, that, uh, you know, are needed and that they could look to. Uh, but I just think, you know, when you talk about how these things go over certain periods of years, you know, you mentioned how long it had been since Water Park. I'm going to lean that way. Yeah. And then I, I obviously and I answered the question in a manner in which I think you were seeking out an answer as far as like rides or attractions or whatever. But, you know, as well, I mean, better than most how much money is poured into the park. I mean, when they put in pavers, which isn't necessarily oh, yeah. a marketable project, that's somewhere between tens of thousands and six figures. Uh, when they, uh, when they paved that section of the parking lot, I, when I worked at Best Buy, they were, and this was 15 years ago or probably more than that. Now they wanted to get the parking lot repaved and they were quoted $120,000. That's for a Best Buy parking lot. This the oh, section yeah. of Kings Island's parking lot they did has to be bigger than that, and it was you know decades later. So I bet it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get that done. You yeah. know, and you know you're looking at other things too. When Adventure Port opened, and just how nice that looked. Mm -hmm. Well, what that did, it also called out how much work needs to be done in Action Zone, right? right? So, you know, you you've got those kind of things too that you you fix up an area here. Well, now it makes you have to address the area there. So there's a lot of things, but uh, you know, you mentioned right away though, Ryan, with this question, you said merger, and I think all bets are off once the merger closes because no one knows what's going to happen. No one knows who's going to be in place at the different parks. Nobody knows what's going to be on the drawing board at the different, how much money they're going to have to spend. 
you know, to put in new capital? Is it just going to be, you know, little touches for a few years? Nobody knows. So it's going to be an interesting time uh, for the new Six Flags company, you know, once that merger closes. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I said that answer in a joking manner, but it was honest because the merger, whether it goes through or not, is going to be expensive. So remember, Cedar Fair, I think, believe has to pay a separation if it doesn't go through. So if it doesn't go through, uh, don't expect those who are afraid of what the merger is going to bring that it's going to be brighter days uh, because it's going to be felt no matter what. And honestly, even if the merger never happened, it would be felt no matter what because of certain climate. And again, check the prospectus of the respective companies, but uh, that's going to be very expensive. And then it comes down to, um, you know, you've got Richard Zimmerman, a CEO, right? And Salim Basul is the uh, um, chairman of the board. I believe that the CEO answers to the chairman. So Salim has the ultimate call. Uh, he originally said he didn't want to put in new attractions because Six Flags has enough. He very much reversed his decision. What's that dude going to be feeling in two years? You know, like he, he originally, now he came from the outside of the industry. So he didn't understand how important it was to have new capital. But still as somebody that hasn't like relished in the industry as long as he has on top of huge cash flow issues uh is he going to be like yeah we'll make what we have work you know but regardless i mean i would say on a year that king's island gets nothing they still get five million dollars worth of painting and upgrades and pavers and all that stuff like the money dumped into the park isn't necessarily everything that's facing you i i mean it ultimately faces you but it's not always marketable you know no, and I think the park too is getting to that age where some years, and they've done this, you know, with the beast and the racer, with you know refurbishing those rides and you know prolonging their lives. Uh, I think that sometimes your existing attractions, you know, need to be touched up and, and put a lot of care into that, so those rides are around for future generations to enjoy. Not exciting, maybe, you know, when you're saying nothing. You know, it's new out there and we're doing these updates to these rides. It doesn't uh, necessarily move the needle for season passes and renewals and those kind of things. But it's important uh, because you have to take care of, uh, you know, some of those signature attractions, too. Right. And that's that's a rock and a hard place, because if you put in Adventure Port, at least you've got Adventure Port to market. But if painting the racer is really your your big capital expense, you're going to have to spend money somewhere else in order to attract people or get real creative. Yeah, or, you know. Yeah, or just, you know, when you say you're you're retracking, you know, a thousand feet of track, you know, everybody's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, What's yeah, new? that's great. When are you that, going to put in a new say. one, you know? But if you rode the racer the last couple of years, it does feel like a, a new roller coaster for a lot of guests. So, uh, you know, there's there's those benefits, too. <laughs> I feel like that um, for, for the vast majority of guests, the retracking thing is a preventative measure where they're not necessarily going to, I'm going to go to King's Island to check out this retract ride, but... It's going to be a thing where they ride it and they're like, oh, that was fun rather than, ow, that hurt. You know? Yes. Uh, so it's very difficult to be marketable. You know, and from a PR standpoint, obviously, that's golden. You can get tons of stories out of it if you know what you're doing. But mm -hmm. at the same time, that's just an awareness piece. Again, no one's buying a season pass or a ticket to ride the racer because it was retracked. No, no, you're right. Cool. All right. Uh, well, great question. I don't know if we gave you the answer you were looking for, but uh, thanks for submitting, uh, Roscoe. Hey, I'm Ryan Sir, along with Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics.